Today on Superhero Ethics, we're talking about Birds of Prey with special guest Jessica Plummer. What is a hero, an anti-hero, or a villain, and where does Harley fall? What is the male gaze, and how does this movie show something different? And when you get right down to it, how much is this movie just a great story about a woman getting over a bad breakup? All that and more, right after this ad we have no control over. Welcome, everyone. This is Matthew, one of your co-hosts. As we said recently, uh, uh, frequent co-host Jacob has recently had to step back, but I am joined today by uh, someone who's been a frequent guest of this podcast uh, and especially has been recently a guest to talk about Harley. So today on a discussion of Birds of Prey, I'm super excited to bring back Jessica Plummer. Jess, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me again. No problem. No problem. And um, for any listeners who are new, do you want to give us just kind of a 30-second bio of yourself and kind of where, you, where you're coming uh, to, these, to these issues are from? Sure. Um, I have been a comic book fan for oof, uh, getting close to 20 years now, which is crazy, um, and awesome. specifically interested in sort of the intersection of comics and feminism and generally sort of social justice um, and how we can improve representation in comics and outreach to diverse audiences um, because I love superheroes and I think everybody should have access to them. Yeah. No, it's fantastic. And it's, um, we had you on uh, a couple of months ago to talk about the character of Harley in general um, and how she's been uh, portrayed in a number of different medias. And I know in that conversation, one thing we talked about was this upcoming Birds of Prey movie and, and what we were looking forward to and what we were maybe a little hesitant about. And so I'm really excited to have you back. Um, and let's just start with kind of a, a general, what did you think of the movie? Birds of Prey. What's your thought? I, I loved it. I had so much fun. I was just smiling the whole time. It was so delightful and the the energy of it was just so... I, I saw somebody describe it as... Uh, it, it's like it has the same energy as the drunk girl complimenting you in the bathroom at a bar, which is yes, such, I mean, it's such a specific experience, but it's such <laughs> a common experience. And it really just has that over-enthusiastic, messy joyfulness to it. Uh-huh. Um, it was smart. It was gorgeous. It was so brilliantly put together and I'm so happy that we have it. I, 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 am very much with you there. And I, I will say, um, I, I obviously do not have much of the experience you just described, <laughs> but I, uh, about six months ago went, went to a, a, a bar that had gender neutral bathrooms and a very drunk woman told me that my bow tie was just absolutely fantastic. And the just joy that it brought her was very infectious. And so yes. I at least have had one experience of what you're talking about there. That is exactly um, it. And you're right. I mean, that's... I I love movie. I love the superhero movies in part. And I will say, uh, unlike you, I'm a dirty casual. And so I'm really glad <laughs> that you can tell me more about the, the comics world. Because I'm pretty much an on-screen and TV guy. But... I mean, I, I love I love those serious issues like you talked about. I love when these stories can explore feminism, can explore racism, can explore issues around who is a hero, who is a villain. And those are great. But sometimes, especially when DC does it, the result is a very serious, we are making a serious movie. And I love that this movie was so fun and so ridiculous. I mean, in many ways, it felt more like Deadpool than anything else, especially with the frequent... F- I, I don't know if you'd call them fourth wall breaks because it's more about being a narrator, but certainly it felt very directly referential to the audience in a way that reminded me a lot of Deadpool um, and just the zaniness and off the wallness. And so, yeah, I was, I was, I expected it to be pretty good. I was very surprised with just how much I loved it. Oh yeah. And I think that um, Deadpool, like if Deadpool had not been made and been a success, this movie would never have been made. I, that, that was, this was very mm. clearly Warner brothers attempting to, do Deadpool. Um, but, and I, I thought Deadpool was fun. I enjoyed it. I stopped thinking about it or caring about it as soon as the movie was over. Ditto for the second yeah. one. Like they're fine. Like th- they are funny. It's, it's fine. Um, I think this one had more going on. Um, mm-hmm. 
in addition to that, that playfulness. But yeah, I mean, DC comics have been trying to make and fairly successfully make Harley their Deadpool for years. So it's not at all a surprise to me that the movie, the cinematic versions of the characters would echo each other in the same way. And if we get a Deadpool three, I'm sure that there will be like tongue in cheek jokes about birds of prey. Oh, I'm sure. And, but I think your point is also a good one. I am on a recent episode. We talked about how movies can sort of tell you how much they want you to care about the morality of the characters. And I think Deadpool was one of the examples we used where, and you can talk about whether it's a good thing or not, but the movie says pretty clearly from the beginning, don't look for serious ethical considerations here. Don't look for serious messages. This is just a ridiculous, have fun popcorn movie. Um, And and I I think it's kind of what you're getting at. Harley to me, uh, Birds of Prey felt different. Like Birds of Prey was that same zaniness, that same, we're going to pull no punches and, and, and not worry about anything. But but it had a lot more to say, uh, and that's kind of why I'm like, we didn't do an episode on Deadpool, and I think there's like a ton we can talk <laughs> about with this movie. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you mentioned before that DC often has these very serious, ponderous movies, which I also think don't really have anything to say. They just think they do. Um, yeah. It's Zack Snyder. I'm looking at you. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> but I also, you know, I don't necessarily need a superhero movie to be a treatise in ethics but i also i think there's a sweet spot between yeah say uh, god whatever christopher nolan thinks uh, he's doing i know people love those movies <laughs> but i can't with them and that's legit and deadpool like i a lot of recent marvel movies i've come out of them like you know the ant-man movies the guardians of the galaxy movies i'm like those were fun they had a great soundtrack i like the lead there's no there there and yeah I think Birds of Prey sat really well in that that window of it's absolutely fun. It's popcorn movie. It's, you know, it's meant to be entertainment that isn't, it's not only frivolous, it revels in its frivolity, but yeah. it also has some very pointed things to say. And I mean, not to get too general but i think uh when you are telling a story about groups that are marginalized it is hard to do that without having things to say because there it's expected and when you're telling a story about straight white cis guys it's understood sort of that that is a quote-unquote neutral viewpoint so you don't have to have a point of view um, and you'll have 20 other movies where it's like, I remember when the first, uh, Wonder Woman, uh, especially when that movie came out, you know, it was expected to carry the weight of what any, whatever anyone had ever wanted from a female superhero movie, mm-hmm. because it was the first and mm-hmm. maybe it was going to be the only. And, and, and you're right. There was a lot of analysis of that being like, what is this movie's statement about, you know, everything involving feminism, sexism, misogyny, et cetera. And, and this movie I think doesn't have that in a way that it, it, but still does, I think, make some really good comments about that. Um, as a quick aside, I wanted to do a quick defense of something. Um, 90% of the Marvel stuff I agree with you with. I think Ant-Man is mostly a silly movie, but has a wonderful commentary on the normal toxic masculine trope of how fathers and stepfathers relate to each other um, hmm. in the way that it inverts that particular trope. Um, yeah, it, it, it's one thing I really love about that movie of where – Scott is able to be friends with his ex-wife's new husband and see her as, see him as another part of his daughter's life without the normal, like, oh, he's my enemy kind of stuff. Um, But otherwise you're right. It's a pretty light popcorn movie. Yeah. Um, I mean, I enjoyed it and I, uh, that's a very good point. And I did like that. It sort of uh, didn't go into the same territory that every single, uh, Tim Allen movie of the 90s yeah, did. Um, pretty much. <laughs> guess who watched the Santa Claus over Christmas? It was me. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so let's let's turn to kind of uh, a little bit more specifics, although we're still kind of staying general on the movie. Um, going back a bit, um, what were some of the things you were kind of really looking forward to or were maybe a little bit trepidatious about, and how do you feel like this movie addressed them? I don't know that I really had 
too much trepidation about this movie, um, mostly because I knew how involved Margot Robbie was with it creatively, um, and especially when we found out that the director was going to be Kathy Yan, who is the first woman of color to direct a superhero movie. Um, not that, you know, I expect women of color to save all the rest of us because we put that pressure on them way too often and it's not For their sure. job to do that. But um, it was clear to me that the people who were making this movie were looking to express viewpoints that we don't get to see that often in film and in, in general and in superhero movies in particular. And mm -hmm. from, I didn't actually see Suicide Squad because God, no. Although I do love the original comic. Um, right. But from everything that I had heard about, you know, Margot Robbie's performance and how she talked about the character and the work she put into the character, it was really clear that this movie was going to be a labor of love and something that was really thoughtfully constructed by the people who were involved in it. So I had a little fear that it was going to get too much into sort of frat bro, gross out humor, sort of Deadpool style. Um, and it didn't really cross that line for me. There were moments that were gorier than I particularly like, but it really didn't bother me um, as much as other superhero properties have, certainly. Um, right. And in terms of things that I was excited about, I just... The the idea because this I mean this isn't the first female superhero movie um, even Wonder Woman wasn't because we we did technically have Catwoman and Elektra and Supergirl which right. all bombed but this is the first one that was an ensemble um, and I was really excited to see that group dynamic I love all of the characters who are in the movie in the comics I mean I, we we did an episode on Harley I am somewhat ambivalent about her in the comics I loved her in this um but I love Black Canary I love Huntress I love Renee Montoya I love Cassandra Cain um this Cassandra Cain is a completely different character but she was still delightful so yeah. I was really excited to see all of those characters. I was really excited to see all of them interacting. I was really excited that the cast had so many women of color in it that uh, one of the main characters is, well, two of the main characters, as it turned out, with the, when we actually saw the movie, were queer women. Um, I don't know if you can say necessarily that Renee is the first canonically queer superhero because she doesn't actually take on a superhero title. Right. But she's still rad as hell. Like, yeah, I just I couldn't wait to see these characters kicking people in the face. And they did that so much. And and I, I put, just on that one thing, and I want to make more general comments. I, you know, there's often this kind of question of like, is the queerness of a character something that you focus on? Or if you don't focus on, does it not count? And how do you do that? And I loved that they they had two very different ends of the spectrum. They had Renee Montoya, who her, you know, uh, former partner who was female, her former uh, uh, romantic partner, who was another woman, was obviously a very uh, big part of her storyline. And then with someone like Harley, um, all you had was just this one throw off moment of in one of those great comic montages where it's showing all of her exes from college that mm -hmm. one of them was, who broke her heart, that one of them was a woman. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was such a brilliant way of doing that, of having like, we're going to have the one character where it's a serious part of the story and the other where it's just like a, a momentary acknowledgement because it's just, it is part of who Harley is, but this movie isn't about that. You know, this movie is about a different part of her. Um, I, I just thought that was a great way to do representation. Well, and I think it really, that really, you're really uh, identifying what's so crucial and what's so crucial about having this movie exist at all and having it be an ensemble film is that as soon as there's more than one, yeah, that person, that movie, whatever it is, does not have to be all things to all people within that demographic. So this movie does not have the one queer person who is supposed to stand in for this is how all queer people are. It has anywhere from three to five and i know we want to talk about that later definitely three <laughs> definitely yep. three queer women maybe queer men unclear um it does not have 
one woman of color. It does not have one woman. You know, this isn't Avengers. Yeah. It's not, you know, the Justice League, the movie, but also the Justice League comic 90% of the time since the 60s. Right. Um, and In that regard, it's not even Wonder Woman, where that movie, no. she has a, a friend, but 90% of the people she interacts with are male. Yeah, this is... And and because it's the second sort of successful uh, superhero movie about a woman, about women, it also, you know, if you, if, if a female audience member saw Wonder Woman and didn't particularly click with it, maybe they click with this because... Yeah there doesn't have to be the one movie that is for all the women now. Yeah. I think that is such an important thing. I, I remember um, uh, at a WISCON a few years ago, I don't know if you went to this, but there was a panel that I went to uh, specifically on the women of color in Luke Cage, the TV show. Yes. Yes. That was a and great one, panel. It was. I remember one of the things that most hit me was when they talked about how important it was to them that they could have a panel entirely on a number of characters who weren't the main character, but all were also people of color and their perspectives. And they just the, the difference between having one character of a minority perspective in the majority world versus actually showing a movie that's much more about that world, you know, or, yes. or, or people of, you know, not just like, let's take a queer person and put them in the straight world or, or what, what have you. Um, yeah. And I, I, I going back a bit, I, I am really just as someone who loves the movie business and the whole business around this. I think what Margot Robbie has done here is pretty revolutionary in that. I can't remember what, when I think about suicide squad, th there were parts of it that I liked. I thought the portrayal of Amanda Waller, who's I think my favorite DC character was fantastic, but so much of it was so bad. And, and the Harley part, especially because you could tell that Margot Robbie was putting in a fantastic performance and making the character very endearing and very lovable and 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 very scary in some ways and like really creating that that line. And at the same time, every 10 seconds, the camera was pointed at her butt or it was showing us some romanticization of her relationship with Joker. Mm -hmm. um, and there was just there were so many little things in this movie that it seemed like it wasn't just that this was her saying, can we not do those things anymore? they created a movie that was a commentary on Suicide Squad and seemed to be very clearly like, you know, an F you to some of that um, from her. I mean, first of all, if nothing else, I know on the last episode about Harley that you and I did, we had a long talk about the, the romanticization of the Harley and Joker relationship and how concerned we were about, you know, the people who look to that as relationship goals. And I feel like, if I know anyone in my life who who still thinks of that as relationship goals, I'm going to take this take them to this movie, because this movie just drives a stake right through the heart of that idea. Yeah, and I love um, that they do it without ever showing him, because yes. he doesn't actually matter. It's her story. Yeah, yeah, and I and just and everything from like her outfits and to uh, there was a great article and I'll try to link for this. Uh, you may have even been the one to tweet it first, but it was all about how this movie is much more about the 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 female gaze, not the male. And we'll we'll talk about that more in a second. But um, there was just there were so many little things like that that so and it it, it makes me really wonder: is this something we're going to see more of? Of where you know uh, an actor actress plays a character for the first time because this is the first time they're doing it. But once they really get known as like, this is who that character is, like, I'd love to see it if they really, if, if this becomes a more normal thing of that person being able to really have a lot more creative control and to say, okay, great. If you want me playing this character, we're doing it more on my terms and we're not having all the sexualization shots and we're having healthier relationships. And um, I mean, certainly I can't think of any other time where it's happened in, in movie history that I know about, especially in superhero movies. And I, I, I hope this is Margot Robbie kind of blazing a path like that because it's... It just was really striking to me. Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of happened. I mean, not certainly not in terms of uh, sexualization or lack thereof. But I mean, that's what Ryan Reynolds did. He played Wade Wilson in whichever Wolverine movie he was in um, and was like, this was awful. Right. But this character seems cool. What if we just made a movie that's actually about what's great about this character and 
when the studio said we're not releasing that he just released it himself um (laughs) which is hilarious but yeah I think when you have these performers who are really um uh assertive and smart and love the character and want that character's story to be told and want want to tell it um it seems like that's a thing that is possible to do now so uh charlie cox if you are listening to this podcast please just release some weird footage of matt murdoch because (laughs) i miss you so much um but yeah i would love to see that happen more with uh characters who aren't white dudes yeah there is as far as i understand there's a rumor that's been pretty strongly confirmed by feige that matt murdoch will be appearing in one of the upcoming movies um, yeah, I saw Kevin Smith talking about that with like a new uh, with the, one of the upcoming Spider Man movies. I, I just, it seems like Charlie loves that character so much, and I also love that character so much. Yeah. And I think Charlie and I deserve this, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, you might have to have a poly thing there. I want to hone in on this, but I am I'm, fine. <laughs> my, you know, I I've said often that this um, this podcast started because of the Marvel Netflix universe. And it started with daredevil. Yeah. Um, and it's, there was so much about that show that I loved so much and so much that I was angry about losing that world. Um, so yeah, I would, I would please Charlie Cox. If you're hearing this, start putting some YouTube. Videos, <laughs> I'm sure he listens. You know? <laughs> I'm sure exactly. he's a fan. I, I, I would hope so. Um, so let's, let's talk about some of those specifics. And one, I, I started to get into, and I, I, I want to hear more of your thoughts on, um, talk about, this movie in terms of it being the female gaze instead of the male gaze, and especially because I think not all of our listeners may not know those terms. Can you give a, like a quick kind of explanation of what the, that means and, and how you felt like this movie was, was, uh, was showing that? Yeah. Um, so the basic uh, definition of the male gaze is it's, it's a film term, um, which I believe was coined by Linda, Laura Mulvey. Yes. Did a little googling right there. Um, nice. But basically, it's the way that women are uh, filmed and shot and presented. Um, it started with film, but it is also any kind of visual art, really, um, because one of the basic tenets of film theory is when you are filming something, you're choosing where to place the camera, and right. so. I actually find it a lot easier to spot often in actual comic books rather than mm. movies because the the images are static and so you can take your time and see like pay attention to what you're seeing and we're so inured to the male gaze in our culture that in a movie it's easy to miss um right because it's the default but it's the sort of thing um you know, in a comic book, you might see a panel uh, where a man is talking and he's like Batman and Catwoman, say. And Bat- Batman will be shot or drawn from, let's say, mid chest up. And mm-hmm. uh, Catwoman, who is facing him, will be drawn or the, the actual borders of the panel will be framed around her so that her butt is visible. Yep. Um, it, I mean, this is, this is super, super common and it's such a default that I don't think that many male artists, male directors, um, you know, men working in, in so many visual fields, I don't know that they're necessarily aware that they're doing it. And even for women, um, we pick it up because it is right. so, so common great examples i've seen of this is um and i ever since i read this i've looked for a lot more and it's so true is that if you just watch for shots of a character walking away that a just there are far more of women than of men doing that and when the men do you almost always see it either you watch his face as he walks away or you watch him from the chest up if you're seeing from Mm -hmm. the back whereas when it's a woman walking away it's almost always you're watching her leave and the camera's positioned in a way to focus on her butt Yes. And there's also something in how uh, women have to present themselves when they are being filmed by the male gaze. And this is something, again, 
um, that's very relevant to Suicide Squad and how Margot Robbie was filmed. And I mean, the, these two films back to back are such a good example of the not even necessarily the female gaze, but the male gaze versus the absence thereof. Um, I, I, like I said, I didn't see the movie, but I have seen GIFs and um, particularly one GIF I've seen a lot compared to Birds of Prey is a moment in Suicide Squad where she's putting on that horrible daddy's little monster shirt and the camera yep. pans down over her body to show her breasts, to show her little booty shorts as she's pulling it down. And it's that kind of sort of default way of presenting the female body. Yeah. Um, whereas the female gaze is less defined because it's less prevalent. Um, mm -hmm. And there are debates about it. You know, it, when we see, for example, the, the, obligatory shot in every Marvel movie now where the hero has his shirt off, you know, yes. the moment in Captain America when Steve Rogers comes out of the thingy and he's all sweaty or the moment in every Thor movie where Thor has to <laughs> take a bath in front of Jane and Darcy for some reason. Um, right. <laughs> or it, like all of these movies have that. Um, is that the female gaze or is that just like this reversed male gaze? Like what does the female gaze mean? Right. Well, there's this sort of limited uh, idea of what men are allowed to find attractive in our culture, which is why um, this movie that stars five beautiful women was supposed to be ugly somehow because um, their eyeliner was messy or whatever. Um, yeah. Whereas the what women the, the, what women find attractive are supposed to find attractive are allowed to find attractive can we even talk about this like there's there's so much debate about it and then you know if if you're a queer female director and you're filming a woman is that going back into the male gaze or is the female gaze like there's so much there um right which is <laughs> probably a bigger can of worms than you expected to open with that question. <laughs> no, I, I, I figured we could go all day just on that, but I, there was one moment in the movie that to me kind of summed up, I, I feel in so many ways what this movie was doing around this topic. Um, and that was when in the middle of the last fights, it, and let me actually just frame it by saying, I think one of the ways I often think about this is when women who are fighters are portrayed in ways, you know, the boob armor, like the, the their wearing outfits or their hair and makeup and, and such is clearly not practical for the things they are doing, but is meant to make them attractive. Um, and there's a moment in the final fight scene where um, Black Canary's hair is getting in her face. Harley notices it and just says hair tie and hands her a hair tie and she pulls up and ties up her hair so she can keep fighting. Um I loved that moment so much because it just felt like such a nice, like, oh, wait, actually having long, beautiful, flowing hair in the middle of a, uh, a martial arts battle, maybe not the most practical thing. And it was one woman recognizing that in the other and just casually just throwing it to her. And of course, she keeps kicking the bad guys while putting up her hair. And what I thought was just like a great moment. Yeah. And it, it also kind of goes back to that um, drunk girl in the bathroom vibe. It's like, in a group of women, somebody's going to have an extra hair tie. Yeah. Like that, that, uh, female solidarity that like, oh shit, does anybody have an extra tampon in their purse? Like that kind of vibe is, I don't know that I would call that specifically the female gaze, but it is depicting the female lived experience right. or at least a, a facet of it. Obviously like it's, it's a, very wide experience. Um, I, I guess what I meant was more it, to be part of the male gaze is you keep her hair long and flowing and never care about the fact that it's probably impractical for her to fight like that. Did, did that right. Make sense? It's only there so that she can do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's long and flowing so that she can do the black widow pose where she flips it back. Right. In terms of like specifically female gaze moments that, I would say more match up with what we're used to in the male gaze. I think the closest one that I can think of um, is 
there's this moment, it's also in that final fight scene, it's a little bit later, where um, Harley is chasing Black Mask, who has Cass in the car with him, and she kind of wipes out, and Helena pulls up on her motorcycle, and, like, she's wearing, like, this kind of, like, baggy moto jacket and a helmet. She's totally covered, but she comes sliding into a halt in front of Harley and Harley the way that Harley looks up at her and the angle at which Helena is shot it's an incredibly erotic moment yeah even though there's nothing about how their bodies are posed or about what they're wearing that would normally signify eroticism in a movie but it's this really physically charged moment of sort of this knight on a white horse coming to the rescue of our heroine, except it's this badass chick on a motorcycle. And that really visceral feeling, yeah. that I think is is where we're really seeing the actively applied female gaze. Um, and like, it's certainly a queer gaze. I myself am not queer, but even I was like, oh, hey, like, there's a lot going on in that moment. Oh, um, I, I've heard from a number of my friends I, for queer women that that scene has registered quite a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I I saw this uh, with a queer friend of mine who, when that moment happened, like, I could just feel waves emanating of just <laughs> like, oh, my God. And And I think that's a perfect example because – if you want to talk about something that is so often portrayed for the male gaze, it's, you know, a uh, woman, woman attraction uh, in these kind of movies. Like I, I know I've often heard from people who are often very nervous about uh, queer women being introduced because of like, is this going to be shown in a fetishistic like way for a guy to get off on two women sharing that energy? Um, and I bet you a lot of straight guys missed that moment entirely, um, which is just to me such oh, a good yeah. sign of like, this is not for that. I mean, like, you know, the, that audience is going to love it. Uh, I certainly did. Um, but it's not that moment isn't isn't like how can we most titillate guys with these two women relating to each other, which sadly a lot of times it is. Yeah. And I know um, a friend of mine uh, was very concerned that that's what the portrayal of Renee would be like. And I saw the movie and immediately like it was like, no, you don't need to worry. That's not happening here. Yep. I, I think that's a very good point. Um, the other thing about uh, the male gaze versus the female gaze, um, and I, I wrote an article about this for Book Riot, um, which, you know, I can tweet or whatever, but um, one, of, one of the things that I notice a lot in the movie is not just, I, ta- I called it the female gaze, but it was the female gaze being averted from female trauma. So there are multiple times in the movie that a woman is being hurt or abused or, you know, otherwise brutalized. And the movie lets us know that it's happening, but doesn't show it to us. So we, I mean, even Harley's backstory with the Joker, it's a very short little jokey cartoon bit in the beginning. We don't wallow in it. We don't see, we don't actually see him hurting her. Um, There's the scene uh, in the nightclub where Black Mask uh, thinks that a woman in the club is laughing at him. She's not. She's minding her own business. Um, And so he makes her stand on a table and strip. Um, And I got very uncomfortable when that scene started because I was like, I don't want to see this woman victimized. And I didn't because the camera doesn't show her body. It shows her face and it shows her feet. Um, but it's it, it all it cares about is situating where she is in the scene and telling us what her emotions are. It is not there to titillate. Um, and also the scene where Black Mask is beating Harley when she's tied to a chair. We cut to a dream sequence which is a riff on the Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend number from, um, is it Gentlemen Prefer Blondes? I think Blonde? it's Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, yeah. Monroe movie. Yes. Um, 
with Harley in that role. And I mean, first of all, I'm a musical theater fan, first and foremost. So <laughs> it was a great moment. Just the fact that there was a musical number, like I'm going to cosplay that look like this made me so happy, but also, no, we're not going to show you a man beating a woman. We're going to show you a metaphorical dance number instead yeah. because it's funny, but also because this movie is not in the business of, uh, being voyeuristic about women's suffering yeah. and that I call it the female gaze averted because I don't have a better word for it, but it is that, that choice to say, no, we're not going to, to showcase this pain for your entertainment. And it was so powerful to me. Yeah. I, I had that exact same cringe moment when that scene started because I've seen that scene so many times before and where it seems very clear the director is thinking of this as, okay, let's use this as an excuse to show a pretty woman in her underwear or even less on screen because the villain stripped her naked or whatever it is. And so the way that was done, I thought was so tasteful and so good. Um, and, and there was one other thing that I wanted to comment on because um, you mentioned also all the problems with the daddy's little monster outfit and that kind of thing. And, I remember one thing we talked about when we did the episode on Harley was that we don't want to seem like we're going too far the other way of saying like that the character being a sexual character and it being a betrayal of a woman who enjoys showing off her body on her terms in her outfit, that that has to be wrong. Um, The problem is that when it's done so much for the male gaze and the long lingering camera shots and things like that. And so I loved that there's a moment when, they're searching through her box of stuff and she finds that shirt, the daddy's little monster shirt. And she, she pulls it away. Like clearly she's like, no one's going to wear that today, but she also doesn't just throw it out. She says this has sentimental value. Um, yeah. To me, that was a, such a wonderful moment of her being able to say like, yeah, she, she's still the woman who's going to wear that kind of outfit sometimes on her terms. And she likes it, but this isn't the time for it. Um, And I just loved that. I thought that was such a nice way of kind of, reclaiming that power without having to, you know, make, make her like have to wear things that, you know, cover her shoulders and her knees. Cause we're supposed to, you know, that, that the avoidance of the male gaze means the avoidance of sexuality. Right. And like three fifths of the team are wearing crop tops for most of the movie. Yeah. Like Helena and Dinah and Harley are wearing a variety of outfits that shows a variety of body parts throughout and they all look incredible. They are stunningly beautiful women. It's just that the camera isn't like, where's the belly button? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is a whole woman with a whole body and a brain inside her head and a story who also happens to have her midriff showing. Yeah. I, I, I definitely think that's true. And I, um, one other moment that I loved, um, we've been talking mostly about the character of Harley and we'll kind of start shifting towards some other th- questions as we go on. But the character of Helena, I loved on a number of levels, but I think especially because she was so socially awkward. I loved it because just that one moment of her practicing her line and them kind of making fun of her for, you know, not having that superimposing presence. It just, it made her so relatable in that way of like, yeah, you can be a badass and totally want to get revenge and get really good at fighting and bows and arrows and still be really bad at coming up with a quippy line on your feet. And that's okay. <laughs> just, I, I, I thought she was so relatable for that. And just the way. That- yeah, it was, it was such an unexpected direction to go. And it was so delightful. Like, I just, I loved it so yeah. much. She was so cute. I also like, I, I love Mary Elizabeth Winstead. I have been wanting them to, cause she, she plays, um, Lucy McLean, um, John McLean's daughter in the Die Hard movies, or at least oh, the, that's what I recognize her from. One. Okay, yeah, yeah, she's in the fourth one, and apparently she was in some a scene in the fifth one that was only shown in the theatrical release, but not in the home video. I don't know. She's in that one somewhere, but not in a scene that I've seen. Um, but I actually love Die Hard Four, and I love her in Die Hard Four, and I've been wanting them to do like a spinoff franchise about Lucy McLean for years. Mm. So if I can't get that, then I will take her as Helena Bertinelli because she was wonderful. I I am certainly a lot more excited for uh, a Huntress movie. And I know you're a big fan of the Arrowverse. Um, 
I I am I've not kept up with it as much as you have more recently, but I do remember the character of Huntress being introduced on that show and her being like an interesting character. But my memory is she was very vampy. You know, she was very sort of the traditional femme fatale. She's badass, but she's in a lot of tight leather and she's there to flirt with um, uh, our hero and, and not really loving that. I thought this portrayal was so much better. Yeah, it's just it's it's different. I mean, certainly Helena has been vampy in the comics. Um, although, I mean, the comics, you know, when you you have a character who's existed since the seventies, like you're gonna get all kinds of yeah. portrayals. This socially awkward thing is definitely new. It's not something that comes from the source material, um, which is totally fine. But we've We've seen vamps. We've seen femme fatales. We, we've got the, and we kind. I mean, nobody in this movie is really a vamp, but the closest to a femme fatale is Dinah, mm-hmm. um, like the nightclub singer who works for the villain. I guess she's not really, but um, this was new, and this was again. It's showing another way that women can be like they're not just vamps flipping their hair back in the black widow pose yeah. a lot of women are real awkward and practice what they're gonna say before they say it and like and, and i feel like often when you do have that character they are completely desexualized or the idea of someone having a romantic feeling towards the awkward one is is portrayed as a joke and so that the same character who has to practice her line in the mirror can look that ridiculously amazing on the motorcycle in that pose. Like that, that to me was really saying something. Um, Yeah. Well, it's almost never a female character. I mean, social awkwardness is supposed to be the purview of dudes on the big bang theory and the Joker movie. Or if it's a woman, it's because she's a, uh, what's the phrase? Manic pixie dream girl, you know, and she just needs to be rescued in some way. Um, yeah. Just because you brought up Dinah in the nightclub, I wanted to make one comment on that, which was it it, it it felt like every detail of this movie was so well chosen. And the song that she sings, um, you know, it's a man's world, but wouldn't be nothing without a woman in it. Um, I, I may be reading too much into it, but given the director, I don't think so. Like that just seemed like such an interesting commentary on what this whole movie is doing about like, you know, both a these women going into the men's world of gangsters and heroes and villains and making the, you know, creating their own space in that world in the movie, but also the movie of bringing this woman's story into the comic book world that has traditionally been seen as a man's world, but, but really is nothing without the women in it. Um, I, I just, I, I got shivers when I heard that song, uh, cause it felt so, so powerful on so many levels for what the story was doing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I I think you're absolutely right that it was very deliberately chosen. Um, Also, two musical numbers in this movie. (laughs) Thank you. And also, that's Journey Smollett Bell. Like, she wasn't dubbed. That's her voice. Like, please record an album. That is amazing. She has such a beautiful voice. Everybody in this movie is so good. Yeah. I I can't think of a a performance where I looked back and thought, like, I, I mean... There's one that I think we're going to have a lot of questions about how they were written, but 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 the acting, I think, was, was incredible across the board. Um, mm-hmm. We're going to take a quick break now to hear from uh, one of our commercial sponsors, who we have absolutely no control over what they say. And we'll be back in a moment. All right, bringing us back in, um, I wanted to shift to another topic I know that you had said you were interested in talking about, um, which is the portrayal of toxic masculinity, especially in terms of women's bodies uh, and, and the way that that story is told here. What's what, what's kind of the, the direction you wanted to take that? Yeah, and I think um, the particularly the relationship between Harley and Black Mask and like the the reason that he hates her um, is so interesting mm-hmm. Because, I mean, this is not a movie that is super concerned with motivation. <laughs> um, like, this this is not a movie that's like, here's the long, elaborate backstory for every character and why they do the things that they do. Um, which is fine, and you don't have time for that in an ensemble piece anyway. Um, and they do some really, really fun stuff with, like, I absolutely love the um, the 
uh, grievances that pop up oh, on the so screen good. whenever somebody is trying to kill Harley. Like, it's so good. Um, but when they finally get to Black Mask and it just like runs <laughs> through this long, long list of grievances um, and you can't really see them. They go too fast. But uh, Kathy Ann has actually provided the full list of them on Twitter and um you know, people, obviously, people pirated the movie and they screenshot it. So, like, I've seen the full list a few times. And a lot of them are really silly, um, like, uh, caused a ruckus or um, called him Queef Richards, <laughs> I think, my favorite. Wow. <laughs> but some of them, like, one of them is, has, have a vagina. Like, that's yeah. why he hates her. Because she is a woman. And that is the only reason. Um, and... All together, again, like with caused a ruckus, they or like talk like some of them are like didn't laugh at his jokes or talked over him or upstaged him. Like Harley is a loud, opinionated, unapologetic woman. And that is why Black Mask hates her so much that he wants to kill yeah. her. Um, and when he attempts to kill her if i'm recalling correctly he screams like she's mine i get to kill her there's like he has this he doesn't seem in any way uh romantically or sexually interested in her he has no desire for her but he still wants to possess her in this really violent destructive way because he assumes that is his right and he is also like this spoiled rich boy who got kicked out of his family for partying and being jackass. And like that sense of entitlement is extremely clearly seated throughout. Um, or again, the scene in the nightclub where he thinks that the random woman is laughing at him when she is laughing at something completely unrelated, but in his head, everything is right. about him. Um or also the scene, I mean, there's so many examples of it, but the scene where he's showing Dinah around his apartment and he's like, and then I have this horrifying thing over here. And she's making all these like, wow, uh, uh-huh, cool. Like, this woman could not be less interested, but he doesn't process any of that because he is such a narcissist. That's exactly what I was thinking. And, yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean it's a hilarious performance. Like Ewan McGregor is doing the most and it's really, really entertaining. Um, But specifically the way that that entitlement and narcissism translates to violence, I think is, and, and with so little actual cause is so interesting. And I think it's, it's a very deliberate choice on the part of this movie to have a female character who is trying to escape a man who wants to kill her for essentially no reason. Yeah. I'm really glad you put that in words because I I had not picked up on uh, that in quite so much detail, but I definitely, I I think you're hitting it right on the head, especially because one of the moments that's occurring to me is I think um, in one of the first scenes in his nightclub, when everybody thinks that she is still with Joker, um, he specifically makes a comment about like, you know, asking about, you know, where is he, you know, and, and that he very clearly sees her as Joker's girl. Um, and, and I think he specifically says something about kind of like being frustrated with her, but that he can't touch her because she's Joker's. Um, and clearly part of the point of the movie is that the whole world sees her to some extent that way, but it seems like he's really the epitome of that because it's part of that idea of, woman as possession and, and, and woman as, um, you know, uh, one man controls her or another controls her. And that when, when Joker, you know, stepped back that, that it it is very much, it's not just that she is now on her own. It's specifically that the other man has stepped away. And so now he can, as the next man step in. Yes. And that the, the different, that there is no difference between stepping in to kill her or to be romantically involved with her. Either way, it's a, I get to control. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think he's a very interesting character. Um, I, I will say I got home that night. Uh, I saw it with my partner and later that night she said, you know, and it, it, 
I really, I haven't seen Ewan McGregor in a movie for a long time, and he was so good in this. And my first question was, wait, he was in this? Who did he play? I had no idea he was Black <laughs> Mask. Um, and granted, I don't think I've seen him in anything since the, the prequels for Star Wars. Um, oh, wow, yeah. But, you know, he just, like, the, the acting performance there was so, so good. And it was, I, I liked it because it was such a twist. You know, recently we've seen a lot of movies with villains who are very identifiable or who are very relatable. Um, this was clearly the opposite, but he also wasn't... Uh, he was, like, clearly just big and bad and evil for the sake of being big and bad and evil, but he also wasn't what I refer to as a mustache twirler, you know? He seemed much more like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, I know this guy. It's not that he's terrifying. He's kind of... He'd be sad and pathetic if he didn't have all these people with automatic weapons around him. Um you know, which I thought was a really nice twist on the normal, like, just maniacal laugh, incredibly powerful villain. Yeah, I actually, um, I saw something just yesterday, um, which I I would link, but to give credit to the person who made this very good point, but it was like scrolling through my <laughs> dashboard on Tumblr, and yep. I'll never be able to find it. And I apologize, person on Tumblr, you're very smart. Um, but basically, somebody said, why do we have all these like whiny, sympathetic white boy villains lately? So you've got, you know, your Loki and your Joker and your Kylo Ren and whatever. And somebody else said, because uh, people noticed that villains were coded as queer or POC. Mm. uh, And that was really problematic. So they were like, guess we better have like white supremacist villains. Um, Cause I mean, if you're a white supremacist, you already right. are a villain. And then white men were like, but I don't like being the villain in this. So you can't do it that Like, you can't make me just the unrepentant villain. There, You have to make this character sympathetic. And, like, obviously this is not a specific conversation that's happening. The general consensus, larger yeah. Cultural pattern. Yeah. Um, and that's why we get these sad sack potentially redeemable, you know, Kyle Rons of the world. Um, And this movie was really interesting because it sort of combined that traditional villainous queer coding with that uh, very uh, white male, you know, born with a silver spoon in his mouth entitlement in the same character. Um, But I appreciated that, yeah, there was no attempt to make him sympathetic or relatable in any way. They were like, this guy is awful and you do not want to get into a conversation with him because he's extremely boring. And the the queer coding comment, especially I think is interesting because I mean, one thing I noticed is that you're right. He he's not portrayed as having an interest in um, e- either really the two women who he's around most, Harley or Dinah. You know, especially when um, Dinah becomes uh, his chauffeur. I, you know, part of me and and he does that whole scene of like you know showing her around the house. There's a part of me that was wondering like, is he is this going to be like uh, a romantic overture and this is going to be really uncomfortable? But it seems that it's much more like he feels like a, uh, a, a man in his position is supposed to have a pretty girl on his arm as like part of the look. Um, and, and, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know if they, they're portraying him as, as queer or, or ace or, or, or any of that. I think to some extent it's, it's left wide open. Um, uh, but I, but I love that, that it, it raises that question about him, but it also doesn't do the, the traditional queer coding things that often happen with villains where it's, the villain's very campy and very effeminate. And it's not even, it, it's not even like queer coding as much as it is to a, a pretty gross uh, stereotype of gay males. Um, yeah. Cause yeah, I think that's, that's a, um, it's again, it's one more way in which I think they're being very intentional about taking some of these tropes and twisting them. Um, now you mentioned there being kind of like three and a half potential queer characters. Was that because he, he was the one you were thinking of as kind of in the maybe category? I was thinking of him and Zaz actually. Yeah. Um, and I would like, look, I, I, again, 
I myself am not queer. I certainly do not want to sit here and say like, this is totally fine and there's nothing problematic. I have cast that verdict. Me, the straight woman, I decide. Because I don't decide. Like, I, I am absolutely not an authority here. I have not seen people. Uh, I, you know, follow a lot of queer people online. Most of my friends are queer. I haven't really seen anybody saying, I didn't like this. This made me uncomfortable. This upset me. But I may just not be seeing that part of the conversation. So I don't, certainly don't want to say like, oh, I'm giving a pass to this. But to me, it seemed like what they were doing with those two characters was not intended to kind of draw that through line from queer to evil, yeah. um, which again is what happens when you have multiple queer characters and like Harley and Renee and Renee's ex are not evil. So you have that plurality. Right. Um, if I were to take a stab at, I mean, and it, it, they're very ambiguous, like whatever's happening between um, uh, Black Mask and Zaz. I would say that my guess is that Zaz is probably in love mm -hmm. with Black Mask and Black Mask is in love yeah. with himself. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's for the fan fiction writers to determine. It, it, like, who's I, the guy in Beauty and the Beast? It's who, open to who's interpretation. Who's the guy in Beauty and the Beast who's in love with Gaston? LeFou, oh, yeah. LeFou. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think that's a really good way of putting it. And I, I, I'm in a similar boat to you. Um, I myself am bi, but most of my partners have been female, and so I don't really claim think I, I have a, a voice of that experience beyond my own personal one. Um, but I, I've, I've seen nothing negative about that connection, and I... I liked that it was a nice like when when Zaz there's one or two things that Zaz says about like boss I'll always be here for you and I remember thinking like I don't know if he means that in a romantic way or in a brotherly way or in a friendship way and I kind of love that I love that it's left wide open um I will say there's very few times where I'm going to say I wish that something was more like the TV show Gotham um but I do think <laughs> the, perform the the person who plays Zaz and the portrayal of Zaz in Gotham is one of my absolute favorite parts of that show. And so this Zaz just like couldn't help but suffer because he was very different. Um, mm. But but the second time I saw it, I think I was able to think of him as like, okay, this isn't Zaz. This is just a, a henchman with a very interesting story uh, and enjoy him a lot more. Because mm -hmm. it was one more interesting dynamic of... And especially because in most movies like that, whether or not he means it as a romantic way, our hero would probably, to some extent, make some kind of gay bashing joke about, you know, their relationship with each other, you know? And, yeah. and there was none of that. There was It was not called out in any way like that. And it's just, when movies just kind of look at that low-hanging fruit and say, like, no, we don't want any part of that, I, I really love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually didn't realize he was Zaz until I saw the credits. I was like, okay, he's the henchman. Because, I mean, there was a little bit about the, like, carving on himself but they didn't really do very much with it he wasn't like walking around with his shirt off going the next one's yeah. for you like he usually does so i was like oh yeah. interesting I, I will say one thing just going back a bit uh and then move to our next topic you talked a bit about how um this movie is clearly very like deadpool laid the groundwork for it i think it's very true those scenes with um like the comic book you know text popping up bubbles all around around like the grievances people have Mm -hmm. I don't think that happens without Into the Spider-Verse because to me that was very – Into the Spider-Verse – and maybe I've, I've missed a lot of things, but Into the Spider-Verse to me was the first movie that really did a great job of bringing the comic book panel kind of thing to life on the screen. Um, and, and this team, to me seemed very uh, uh, emblematic of that. Yeah, I mean I I'm not sure if it was – a direct reference because I don't know if there would have been time in the production, but probably it would have been a post-production mm. thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, we could do an episode on into the spider verse, but it would just be me <laughs> screaming because it's perfect. Um, and yes, the way that it, it, it is a comic book that moves um, in this, in this way that it is so, in love with what a comic yeah. book is and that is so in love with what animation is. I, I think I, it, I love that I, movie unless so much. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure we've already done an into the spider verse episode, but I can probably get you on to get it back if for nothing else, because 
the person I recorded it with didn't understand the thing I think you will, which is it is also the most New York movie I've ever seen. Um, it is oh, so yeah. it so captures the New York outside of the Upper West Side Manhattan kind of experience. Um, uh, but so moving on, um, I think another thing that I certainly want to talk about is the portrayal of the breakup, um, because I, I, and we've gotten into it a little bit before, but I want to just more talk about it from the, the breakup perspective. Like, I think of all the things that this movie is great at, it is also a wonderful, like, you just got your heart broken and you need to watch a movie with a bottle of wine and some ice cream, which is, I, I think, traditionally seen as a woman experience, but I'm going to claim that very much. I've needed that moment all the time. <laughs> and in terms of, like, I, I took a good friend who had recently had a breakup and, and was in that, you know, stage of, like, you know, will will they take me back? Will they not? You know, am I okay? And And she said it was just this incredible, like, wonderfully cathartic experience of seeing in a superhero movie and all the other things – but it's also a story of a woman who has just been dumped by someone who she idolized. And now, like, over the course of the movie, you basically see him falling off the pedestal for, for her. And and you get to see mm-hmm. that story of her coming to realize that what she thought of as incredibly romantic was actually incredibly abusive. And I just thought that was brilliant. And And one more thing about the movie that I... Especially given how bad that relationship was in Suicide Squad, I absolutely loved the way they did it here. Yeah, I I really um, particularly love the mirroring of the two margarita scenes, um, where the first time, like she's out, she's drinking with her girls, and it's sort of what you were describing: the I'm going to get drunk and I'm going to forget him, but it's not real yeah. yet she hasn't internalized it and by the end of the movie she is in a place where she she knows that she is enough and she has people who agree that she is enough um and she is able to have that that release with like uh, you know in what uh, amounts to a safe space even if she then immediately uh, leaves it yeah. with Cass and goes and robs a <laughs> bank or whatever, which I also love. Yeah, no, it, it's very true. And certainly the, like, you know, the moment of, like, you know, tearing up the picture of the ex or, you know, ripping up the, their shirt or something, you know, blowing up the chemical factory is maybe that moment taken to a bit of an extreme, but it's certainly a, a great portrayal of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the hair cutting, like, it's... I, I believe I am citing something that I read a very long time ago when the first season of Veronica Mars aired. So that, that'll give you some context, but um, I believe that it is, it's certainly anecdotally very common. um, But I think there are maybe some numbers on it um, for women to cut their hair very short after Mm -hmm. trauma. Um, I just, it's just one shot, but the hair cutting is, such a an iconic moment to me yeah no I, I i definitely see that there and i think it's just it's it's one more thing that i, I feel like that was, was so good there um well let's the, the the comment about her robbing the bank at the end is kind of a great introduction to the next thing we want to get into which is where does harley and where do the rest of them sit in terms of are these heroes are these anti-heroes are these villains we just think are kind of fun um what, what, where, where do you kind of fit, fall on some of those questions? I mean, I think one of the things that the movie... The movie is more interested with harm and doing harm or preventing harm than it is with the yeah. law. Um, and we see that over and over again, like... Everybody knows that Cass is a thief, but nobody really cares all that much. Like, she gets picked up by the cops, but, like, Renee doesn't care yeah. that much. Because it's not, and not that it's a victimless crime, but these these are not... She's stealing luxury items from wealthy people, mm-hmm. it seems like. Um, and And so that is never really positioned as... 
it's really not positioned as at all yeah. bad. <laughs> like the movie's never like she shouldn't do that. I mean, she probably shouldn't if it's going to get her killed. But other than that, it's fine. Um, Harley robbing banks or whatever, becoming a criminal mastermind at the end of the movie. Nobody's too concerned with that because we know Harley and we know that she is never punching yeah. down. So she can do what she wants. Like, have have fun. Harley can have a little crime as a treat. Like, on the one hand, um, the, Acme, the Acme Chemical Company had nothing to do with her actual relationship. And you can sort of be like, why do they have to have their factory blown up? But also, they're a huge chemical conglomerate. Who cares? Um, I mean, think of all the suffering they put Wile E. Coyote through. Yeah. <laughs> they deserve that. That's a good point. I, I forgot, actually, that that's all. Yeah. Like, Warner Brothers. I've never made that connection before, but that's true. It's the same universe. Bugs Bunny has met Superman. Okay, I'm not ready for that. But I, um, well, to me, <laughs> this is a sequel to Space Jam. Th- there was one other moment that for me was so perfect on that, and it's funny because I, um, I don't mean to keep self promoting, but this is a, a another topic we did pretty recently. Is when is it justified to use violence against people who aren't really evil? but are kind of just in your way. Um, and and talking about, like, maybe it's not always okay to, to like, to harm the person who, like, you know, is in your way, but isn't necessarily the, the bad guy. And so the fact that she goes in with a beanbag shotgun when she does that wonderful scene of taking down the cops, I thought was so good. Because what it showed is, like, the Gotham Police Department are clearly not great people by any means, but they're also not, like, all horribly evil people. They don't deserve to die so that Harley can steal what she needs to steal. And so she goes in fully planning to completely immobilize these people and beat the crap out of some of them and, and, and hit some of them in the head with a baseball bat, which Daredevil has established is never a lethal move. And so we'll, we'll be okay with that. Uh, yeah. That's no, fine. But like, it's fine. It's just the yeah. off switch. <laughs> like, the, the, when the first beanbag hit, I was just so happy because I was like, okay, so what we see here is a character who, you know, I mean, getting a beanbag, you know, into a, a shotgun instead of just regular bullets, that, that takes a lot of effort. And what that showed me is that Harley is thinking, I got no problem with the law and these cops are, you know, she calls them pigs and idiots and she does, she has no love for them, but she also doesn't want to kill them. Um, she thinks that's maybe going a little too far. And that was... That that moment was just like such a great like, OK, yeah, she can. This is that kind of like. I almost feel like she's kind of like hero villain agnostic, you know, she's just sort of like eh, morality. I have my own morality. There's the things I really care about and everything else. Well, who cares? Yeah. And I mean, any other movie in this sort of vein, like Suicide Squad, those would have been real bullets. Deadpool, those would have been yeah. real bullets. Um Punisher is 100% using real because bullets. Because then you... Oh, God, yeah. Because then you could have... Because the, the scene would have been designed to show how cool the protagonist was for killing all of these people. Um, and this movie still lets us see how cool and amazing and tough yeah. Harley is. But without killing anyone... And also, it's funny. She doesn't just hit them with beanbags. She fills them with glitter. (laughs) It's hilarious. But also, um, uh, it doesn't connect that closely in the movie itself because of the way the movie plays with chronology. But for Harley, chronologically, this comes right after she has spent all morning being chased by people who want to kill her because they have grievances against her. And she lists all the things that she did to them. And a bunch of them fall under that category. Like, Black Mask, no, he has no case here. But she did, like, break a guy's legs because he said something rude to her, which, I mean, (laughs) good for her. But also, like, don't actually do that. Um, There's the guy whose face she tattooed like a clown. Like... That's not really okay. And, and, and while I'm all for um, the calling out of guys who make, you know, awfully sexist, you know, approaches, you know, feeding them to a hyena might be seen as a little bit over the top. Yeah, like there is, I mean, some of them feel more or less justified than others. But we do get a whole litany of Harley being confronted with all of the things that she did and that she made the choice to do while she was with the Joker. Like, it wasn't just him. Um, she is an adult who can decide for herself. 
And I think it's really telling that the very next thing that she does, she does with the intention of doing no permanent harm to That's anyone. funny. Because she's like, oh, all the stuff I was having fun doing, that fucked up a lot of people's lives. It's funny. I hadn't made that connection, but now I'm thinking it really is true, especially because, you know, some of the worst of those, like the the person where she, she tattooed the clown on their face, like that was things she did with Joker and very much under his influence. And Joker certainly, like, would have no problem going in and shooting all those cops. And... It's interesting, I hadn't even thought of that, but it, it's a nice actual moment of her further emancipation because she's doing a criminal thing just like Joker would, but in this way, she's making a fundamental change. You know, she's not doing the lethal force that Joker would. Yeah, and, and to be fair, I didn't think of it that way until you were describing the way she goes into the police station, and I was like, oh my god, but right before that, this movie is so smart! <laughs> It, it's so rewatchable. I, I feel like I can f- watch it four or five more times yeah. and still get more things out of it. And they're they're releasing it early on uh, home heard. release, so maybe by the time this episode <laughs> goes be up. nice. Well, and so I mean, obviously we, we've talked a lot about Harley, but this is an entourage movie, um, an ensemble movie, I should say, not an entourage. Um, where it's a little yeah, above. Where, where do you feel some of the other characters fit on this uh, the hero anti hero villain kind of kind of line? Um, I mean, I would say that Dinah is probably the most traditional hero, but she's also the most traditional hero in the comics. Yeah. Like, she, uh, f- among other things, she's the only one with a superpower, um, which was fantastic. And it's very Dinah to not use it until she absolutely has to, because she almost never has to, because she's one of the best martial artists in the DCU, and she's amazing, and I love her. Um but she's like she is the daughter of a costume superhero who worked with the police like very much in the traditional model um and she has a super uh, superpower like she has all of the ingredients but she's really jaded when we meet her and she kind of steps back into it at the yeah. end um and helena is I mean, she murders gangsters, so she is an anti-hero, but she clearly wants to just be a hero. Like, she's the only one who's wearing a mask yeah. at the end, which is like, I don't know why you're bothering, because you didn't do that before, but it's fine, I guess. Because she just, because she, it's clear that she's playing dress up, because she wants to, because she has this vision of who she wants to be, and she's yeah. finally there, and I'm happy for her. And to me, that's um, a really nice idea, like... I'm always interested in what happens in a world where superheroes exist. Like to me, her character is 100% a product of, you know, probably seeing Batman and Superman while she was a child. Um, you know, and that, that desire to dress up like that and to, and to be that, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's the model that's been set for her. Um, well, I mean, in originally, like the original version of Helena in the comics was actually Batman's daughter. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, she's, uh, yeah, she was um, in the 70s the, uh, on Earth 2, which was sort of their backup uh-huh. Earth. Batman was a little bit older, and they could kind of experiment with him and do things that they couldn't do in the main universe. So he and Catwoman got married, and they had a kid, and their kid was was Helena Wayne. Um, and then then in the, in the, after the Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985, uh, got rid of all the alternate Earths, including Earth 2, somebody liked her and decided to keep her. And so she became Helena Bertinelli and her origin is pretty much exactly the same as it is in the movie. Like she was from a mafia family and a rival family killed all of her relatives. And so she dedicated herself to revenge. Uh, That's 100% what her backstory is in the comics. Um, I like it. But currently Helena Wayne is also maybe uh, continuity (laughs) is a little bit of a mess right now. We have, like, a Helena Wayne and at least two Helena Bertinelli's oh <laughs> in continuity currently. I think it's a mess. They're all awesome. But, yeah, she, even once she was no longer Bruce's biological daughter, there's very much a push and pull. Because he doesn't right. approve of her because she kills people. And it was once she started working with the Birds of Prey, um, Black Canary and um, 
in the comics, it's Barbara Gordon, who is the first Batgirl that right. became Oracle. She stopped killing people, um, but she definitely has a sort of push-pull with Batman of wanting his approval and uh, saying, no, you're not my real dad. I can mm-hmm. do what I want. And so I really like the idea of her as a character who really wants to be a superhero in that classic way but also sometimes shoots people in the throat with an arrow well there's a couple things i want to say there one is i really hope we get a sequel to this movie and i will say for purely selfish reasons or at least from my own like perspective reasons i really want to see oracle um because i i i've never seen that character on screen much but from everything i understand oracle is one of the best examples of a hero who is a hero while being disabled without having superpowers that erase her disability. Um, and that's, that's something I I've talked about before. It's super important to me. And so I'd, I'd really want to see her. Um, but in terms of, of uh, Huntress, there, there were a couple of things I, I was going to say there. One is th- when you mentioned she was Bruce Wayne's daughter, my only thought there is please tell me she never gets romantically involved with Robin. Oh, of course she does. Uh, of course she does. <laughs> Which also, when you think about the age difference, he's like 15 years older than her and has known her since she was born. So it's it's weird. OK, there's there's some problems there. Um, but the other thing is, I, and this is something you and I actually talked about when you were a guest on a, our, our show for The Punisher, is for me, there's a real line between vengeance and justice. And I think a lot of it comes from, you know. Are you the person who says these people wronged me and so I must kill them and I will feel better? Or is it these people wronged me and yes, I want to get them specifically, but I also want to make sure no one else gets wronged the way I do, you know, and that's when it crosses out of just being vengeance into something more, as you said, traditionally heroic. And I so love for that reason, um, the moment when, uh, Huntress, uh, you know, sort of recognizes, uh, um, uh, Cass as being in that same situation she was of being the young scared girl in the midst of all this violence and gives her that toy car that her brother had given her um t- to me that was just such a poignant moment of of showing that for Huntress it's not just about the revenge it's about being that hero who wants to make sure no one else goes through what she did well I think that is the moment she becomes that hero like I think that's mm. where that switch flips for her yeah I could yeah I love that moment it was it was really good. I, I am curious, and maybe it's because of the superpower, but I'm I would have said that, especially since Diana resists it for so long, that to me the most not superhero, but the most heroic person in the movie is uh, Montoya. Um, were you thinking of her not because she doesn't have superpowers, or do you th- do you not see her as heroic in that same sort of way? No, I think um, it's not that I don't see her as heroic. It's that I wasn't seeing her necessarily in a superhero mode Mm. because she is a cop for most of the movie. Um, And I did want to talk about her because I think it's really interesting. Uh, Like I I think I said earlier something about how this movie decouples its morality from the law. It's not really concerned with the law. It's concerned with harm and preventing harm. Um, Right. And, Montoya, she leaves the force at the end of the movie because the, because that is also what she is concerned with. And the force is not like they don't care about who is hurting whom they care about the law. And that is not enough for her. Um, and I mean, that is a whole complicated other conversation like is you know, on the one hand, given the way the police in this country often behave, like yeah. I certainly do not want movies that glorify violence or glorify um, violence <laughs> that glorify <laughs> <Too late. laughs> uh, <laughs> that glorify cops. Like I find that really troubling. Yeah. I find that to be basically propaganda. But at the same time, I'm also pretty uncomfortable with uh movies that are like you should act outside the law if you feel like it which this movie basically does um but in such like a kind of giddy tongue-in-cheek way that it bothers me less than like the punisher um i think it, it this 
I think Renee walks that line really well when she could, it could have fallen into either, fallen off the edge in either direction. Um, yeah, but yeah, she, I mean, she is, she is the person who, she is the only person who's trying to do the right thing the entire movie. Yeah. I, I guess in that, I think that's why I thought of her as the, in the heroic role, but you're right, not the superhero role. Um, in some ways, and I don't know if this is like, a somewhat intentional parallel or if this is just my limited uh, comics knowledge, but she seems in some way um, a Jim Gordon type character in that she like, cause I, I often think of Jim Gordon as in that role with Batman of he's the one who's trying to say, wait, we should work within the law, but who also recognizes the fundamental brokenness of the legal system. And so kind of understands why Batman goes outside of it. And Montoya takes a step that I don't think Gordon ever takes, or at least doesn't in most stories of just, like you said, flat out leaving the force. Um, but that conflict that she's going through of we're supposed to follow the law and the law is supposed to be good. What happens when the law isn't good? I don't know how to handle this. Th- that to me felt very much like things I've seen Jim Gordon go through. Uh, does, is that is that a comparison that makes sense? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, like he he in the comics has very much been a mentor to her um and i think that they they both represent that conflict and in the comics she did actually eventually leave the force and um she becomes a superhero she becomes the question after the original question dies um oh wow so i yeah yeah it's awesome um (laughs) although now the original question is back and so there's just two of them it i it's it's a mess right now. <laughs> okay. Don't get me started on the, I enjoy rebirth, but it yeah. is very hard to figure out what is and isn't canon. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, she, she is always a character who has sort of struggled with that kind of like, I want to do my job. Well, I want to do what's right. What if those aren't the same thing? Right. Yeah. And I I think that's in a movie where most of the characters have already decided that that's not something they're going to worry about anymore. Um, I really like having her character because it's a nice kind of balance to that, you know, and in the end, like all the ones who are saying screw the law win. And I think with good reason in it. Um, But but even there, I liked that at the end of the movie, it's not that all they all decided to work together in that moment, but then they do kind of split apart. And it's clear that the birds of prey are established to be, you know, they're vigilantes, but they're, they're in theory, white knights, you know, they're, they're chaotic good. Um, whereas Harley is, it seems she has kind of a grudging respect for them and, and she's going to stay margarita buddies with them, but is <laughs> pretty clearly not, you know, and if they're facing something truly bad, they might call her up, but it's just as likely that they might try to stop her for something because, you know, she's, she's not going where they're going. Yeah. Which is a direction that I love for Harley. Like I love that she, like you said, they're chaotic good. She's just, she's chaotic neutral. She's yeah. pure chaos and she's, she's Bugs Bunny and I, I love her for it. Well, and based on that, what is your take on, you know, what, what is her kind of moment of moral crisis where she, at one point tries to sell the girl to what she knows might well be uh, a horrible end for the girl um, to protect herself. Um, Cause that definitely seems it, it's an interesting thing to me where like most movies, that's the moment where you're like, okay, this person's irredeemable. Um, and clearly with Harley, that's not how they portray it. And I, and I, I didn't feel like they should, have, I, I felt like I liked the way they portrayed it. Um, what, what's your kind of take on, what they do with Harley in that, in that part of the story and how it fits into her being a a hero or a villain or an anti-hero. Yeah. I mean, I think that they, they, it comes in to the movie, obviously like structurally it would come in three quarters of the way through the movie because that's when that kind of thing happens. We have already spent an hour and a half getting to know Harley and falling in love with her. So we like, if she did that in the first 10 minutes of the movie, we'd be like, no, thank you. Um, we she is she is such a she is a character who is both carefree and careless so often Mm. that i think we let 
a lot of her bad choices slide because of that. And she knows it's wrong when she's doing it. We, the viewer, know that it's wrong. But there's a certain pass because of who she is. Obviously, there wouldn't be a pass if she was like, and then I moved on with my life. Right. But because she because she does things so sort of impulsively and because she is struggling so hard to keep her head above water it's it's a moment that is understandable mm-hmm. even if it's not acceptable but then of course she immediately redeems herself for right. having attempted to do that and, and on some level like anyone who's seen a movie knows that she's going to redeem herself like there's no way this yes. movie ends with that girl being dead um right but um i i think also that the last thing you said about the situation she's in and i'm 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 finding as i'm making a connection here one more move one more way in which i think this movie is so smart because as i'm thinking about it i'm thinking there are there are two characters in this movie who in one case for all the movie and the in the, another one for a significant part of the movie spend, have a perspective of, I have to look out for myself and to hell with anyone else. And it's Harley and it's black mask. But the difference is for black mask, it's I'm already incredibly comfortable. I want more power. I want more money. I want more respect and to hell with anyone else who gets it, who gets in my way. We have no sympathy. We have no understanding that person just comes across as a total villain. Whereas for Harley, she does in that moment have that same attitude of I need to keep myself. I need to look out for myself. And if it means this kid gets in trouble, well, I can't worry about that. But for her, it's in a moment when like her life is literally on the line. Everyone who she thought she could count on, you know, even this wonderful, uh, you know, elderly uh, uh, landlord she had who she thought, you know, adored her. He just sold her out. Like, I, I, I feel like it. it's, her and Black Mask have do kind of the same thing, but her perspective makes so much more sense because she's been betrayed by everyone she knows. She's been she has nowhere to turn. She's her life is 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 literally on the line. I feel like it, it it's a really interesting counterpoint because her actions there are, I think, like you said, none of us like cheer it, but we also have that moment of like, I think she's doing the wrong thing, and I'm not sure I would do this. I, I hope I would do differently in her situation, but I can't promise myself I would. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's really pushed into it. Um, and I think it also, it, it goes back to what I've been saying about the, the movie's morality being based in the harm that you do or that you prevent. Um, like her lowest point is when she allows this child who is under her protection to come to harm's way. Right. And the, Other things that she does a lot of things that are not right or good as society deems them, as we've talked about at length. And she remains a villain at the end of the movie, or at least she remains a criminal at the end of the movie. And she's gleeful about it. And we're gleeful about it because it doesn't really feel like she's hurting anyone. But in that moment where she hurts somebody that we care about, that's when we're like, no, Harley, like that's too much. And that's for her that moment of, oh, wait, this was too much. Right. Um, and I think that it, the sort of reverse of that uh, is with Dinah when she sees Harley about to be raped. Um, I mean, that's what that scene is. Mm-hmm. And this is a character who is really jaded. She works for a man who she knows is a criminal and she knows is a murderer. And she's going, she's just, she's not doing anything about it even though her mother was a superhero because she just, for whatever reason, she's made the choice not to, but that is the moment that she cannot let slide. And she doesn't even like Harley, Yeah. but she steps in because she cannot, she knows what's going to happen and she cannot allow it. And that's the moment we're like, okay, we like this character. Like we are on board with this character. Yeah, I, I remember having a feeling like if she had dripped, like she's in her car, she starts the engine. And I remember thinking like if she drives away, I'm going to have real trouble like, <clears throat> you know, watching her hero turn later in the movie. Um, 
and I loved that. And especially, be- but especially because she did it not in a like, all of a sudden I see the light way. She's like, you know, rolling her eyes, you know, sighing like, fine, I gotta get this idiot girl out of trouble, but then doing it. Um, and I, I, in in some ways, especially from an ethical perspective, her she she's the character who I think I'm I I found most interesting because. First of all, she she has the actual superpower, like you said, that none of them, no one else has. And there's always the question that comes up of, you know, is is Uncle Ben right? Like, does great power come with great responsibility? And I I like that a lot of movies recently are really questioning that. Like, you know, maybe you don't have to be a hero just because something weird happened to you. And I I, I like that it I don't feel like this movie is saying like Dinah would be wrong to not become a vigilante. Like she has this power. But she saw her mother get killed because the cops didn't, you know, help her the way they were supposed to. And it sort of puts her in a moment of it's not because she feels this like sort of societal like, you know, I have to do the right thing. It's the people she has come to really care about in that moment are in danger. And that's why she has to use the power or or in the case, she just sees this terrible thing that's going to happen. And and she has to use that. She has to do what she can. Um, yeah, I think it's. I agree with you. It's not saying with great power comes great responsibility. I think it's saying like, you don't have to give up your life to be a superhero. If you don't want to Harley and Cass don't do that. Right. But if you see something wrong right in front of you, you have to stop it. Yeah. And and I imagine this isn't talked about, but I also got the sense that, part of why Dinah feels it is also because she's a part of that world. You know, if she had been totally divorced from all of that, I, I think maybe she, she, I still think she does what she does with Harley, but, but the way that it was shot and what we saw, like the kind of way she was looking around, part of what I got the feeling of was her sort of feeling like what's happening to Harley is a part of the world that I'm part of too. And that I'm kind of supporting with what I'm doing. And, and that, that, that puts a little more onus on me here. Um, the other thing that I really liked is, uh, and I think you commented on this before, she only uses her power once and only at the very end. Because part of what that is to me is that when she rescues Harley, it is Dinah who does that. It is not Black Canary. Like, she doesn't become Black Canary, really, until she uses that power at the end. And that it, I, I like that idea of there being, a, like, it's a step-by-step process, but that there's a difference between... I see I see a particular wrong happening right in front of me versus I'm going to get into this sort of like epic battle to stop, you know, to stop this terrible thing uh, that happens at the end. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I, I think that kind of was there anything more on, on this kind of concept of, of choosing to help or the responsibility to help you wanted to get into or should we kind of uh, move to our last things? I just I mean, I think like, look, I my favorite superhero is Supergirl. I love the whole super franchise. I love with great power comes great responsibility. I love the idea that, you know, there are these characters who dedicate themselves to doing good. But I think that that smaller idea of if you see something bad happening in front of you, you have to stop it, but you can, you know, as long as you're not doing anything bad, live your life Right is, a really refreshing take and a a much more achievable goal. Yeah. No, I I think that works. And I, I think part of actually the difference is I, I, I kind of wonder if we could maybe change the phrase to with great power and great privilege comes great responsibility because I do feel like if you're a straight white cis man, I have a lot more of a feeling of like, there's a part of me that's like, yeah, you have that power, go use it. Um, but I think of that in contrast to someone like Luke Cage, where it's, you know, him as a black man using that power that, you know, it was forced upon him for things that had nothing to do with his choice. And by using that power, he puts himself in danger of a racist society that hates a black man with power in a way that super, that Clark Kent is never going to feel that Peter Parker is Mm -hmm. never going to feel. Um, and so for Dinah, as a woman of color in a, in a very disadvantaged situation, you know, working where, where she does and the like, I, I sort of feel like not that that gives her a pass, but it definitely I, I feel like it troubles the question in a really important way that that the responsibility of what she does with her power 
for me looks very different than for Clark Kent or for for Peter Parker or even for um uh Kara. What, what's Kara's last name? Supergirl. I should Danvers. Know this. Yeah, thank you, Kara Danvers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think privilege functions as essentially another power or another aspect of power. So if you are invulnerable, then yeah, you put yourself between the bullet and the innocent civilian. And if you are white, then you take out your phone and you film when you see the police doing something they should not be doing and you ask questions like right. they're, they're different manifestations. Of, and I mean, that's the whole, for me, that's so much of why I love superheroes. Like most of us, possibly all of us can't shoot laser beams out <laughs> of our eyes. I haven't checked with everyone, but you know, we, we can't fly. We can't, you know, shoot flames out of our hands or Mm -hmm. freeze a lake by touching it or whatever. But we do have power. We all have whatever abilities we have. And we also have whatever privilege and the accompanying power society confers on us by virtue of the bodies and the uh, socioeconomic structures that we are born into and continue to live with. Um, And I, I do genuinely feel that we have at least some responsibility. Again, I don't necessarily think that, you know, everybody needs to give up everything else that they're doing and dedicate their entire lives to saving others. But there is a responsibility to use what we have. Yeah. No, I think that's very true. And I, I love your description of why um, superhero stories are so important for that reason, because, um, you know, it like you said, none of us have those superpowers, but we all have some some responsibilities. And especially and I, you brought up this point wonderfully about the cops. But I think also, you know, we're recording this in the midst of a, a global pandemic in which we uh, at least in the United States, the government response has not been what many of us would want it to be. Um <laughs> And it's to me the the fundamental question that superheroes ask is what happens when the authorities that all of us count on can't deal with the problem, either because they're not powerful enough or because they're not corrupt or because they don't have the will to, you know, what happens when when someone has to step up and say, I can't just trust the cops to do it. And I think to that extent, it's a wonderful metaphor for our own world of like, you know. I grew up being taught that if I walked down the street and I saw the cops, you know, putting someone in a bad situation that I could trust the cops and things, things were okay. Mm -hmm. I can't do that anymore. I, you know, I can't trust that if there's a, like, you know, I I remember a a good friend of mine uh, talked to me for a while because he wanted my help with a situation where he had um, a black neighbor who would often get drunk and, um, you know, cause a real ruckus in the building. And part of him was like, I was taught that this is a situation where I call the cops, but calling the cops on a young black man when he's drunk could be, you know, lethal. Um, And and so how do you deal with that kind of a situation? And I think it's what I love about hero stories is that they find new ways for us to to have to think about that question. And it's not just what, you know, when does Superman kill or when does, um, you know, Wonder Woman take the law into her own hands? It, It those those questions and how we think about them can help us identify that for ourselves. And that's, to me, that's the whole point of this podcast. And so I love um, the perspective you're bringing, because I think, you know, it, it's what I was saying at the beginning. This is the epitome of a popcorn movie. It is fun. It is, you know, pretty colors. It is great fight scenes. But it's also like, it's it's very subtly pushing all of these wonderful messages that are that really give us a lot to think about. Yep, Absolutely. So is there any kind of uh, last closing thoughts you want to say before we wrap up? I love this movie so much (laughs) and they should make 10 more (laughs) is how I feel about this movie. (laughs) Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, This is, this this is very much the kind, is a different kind of superhero movie that I've seen and one that I very much want to see. And I, I, I like what you said at the beginning that it's not that this has to be like, you know, 
all women superhero movies should be like this because that that's not the case. It's not there, there's going to be so many different kinds of movies for so many different reasons, and I think that's great. But I I loved what this movie did. It is one of the few that I've had. I I I can't think of a like a part where I'm like, well, but this was really problematic. And that's, you know, this podcast exists because normally you can find something problematic in the movie. So <laughs> that alone's a good sign. So, um, Jessica, thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, uh, I hope our listeners, they probably have heard you before, but but either way, um, I'm guessing a lot of them are thinking like, yeah, that, that's someone whose thoughts I want to learn more about. Where can they find your writings and, and other ways to kind of keep track of uh, what you're putting out there? Um, so most of my writing is at bookriot.com. I mostly write about superheroes because I love them. And, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jess underscore plumber. Awesome. And we'll, we'll have links to both those in the show notes. Um, and I know it's on hiatus, but, um, are you, you, you also have a podcast that I, that I've quite enjoyed. It's, it's off of hiatus. Oh, great. Um, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We put up, uh, finally our episode, <laughs> uh, it's called flights and tights. Uh, it's a Superman movie podcast, so uh, my co-host Rebecca and I have been covering every Superman movie, um, and we finally put up our episode on Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice, Oof. which spoiler we did not like very much. <laughs> I am I am um, very excited to to listen to that sometime soon. It was a lot of fun to record, if not a lot of fun to watch. And we've got uh, Justice League in the can as well. So that'll be going up uh, next week. Awesome. Well, I, I'm really looking forward to that because I, I think I've said to you before, but I'll say here, um, you all really fundamentally changed my position on Superman. I I did not yes! like <laughs> Superman as a character in the slightest. Uh, well, I should say, I mean, when I was six years old, the Christopher Reeves movies <laughs> were my absolute, you know, first love. But but I, I distinctly remember like watching the Tim Burton Batman and being like, oh, wow, like, yeah, that's what I want a hero to be. You know, Superman's a wuss. Um, he's a, you know, Boy Scout. And, you know, I, I hadn't seen many good portrayals of him. And I you really opened my eyes to where he, what he can look like and, and, and some other things. And, and since then, this podcast has has actually done um, two episodes on Superman comic books, specifically um, Kingdom Come and Rising Sun. Uh, both of which I think just really play with some great questions about Superman's power and his character and, and, and what does it do to a person to really think that they have that much responsibility for everyone else. So it is a great podcast. I would strongly recommend it, and we'll have links to it on here. Um, for everybody else, thank you guys again for being listeners. Um, it is uh, I'm hoping especially now that a lot of us are inside or a lot of us are, are going to work when we really don't want to be. Um, or doing work that is uh, incredibly needed. And, and for all, all those who are working in those kind of jobs, thank you so much. But for, for whatever your situation, um, I, I hope podcasts like this are enjoyable to listen to. And we do this because we love the conversation, and I want to continue it with you all. So you can find us on, <clears throat> excuse me, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on email, all at Superhero Ethics. Links to all of those are in the show notes. Um, I also, we also have a, for those who want to support the show, we have a Patreon. Um, and I will say actually a, a special thing I want to say, uh, a special thing I want to offer. Um, Matt Carroll, the host of the MCU podcast and the, the kind of founder of the Stranded Panda Network that this is a part of, um, he and I both find ourselves with an awful lot of time on our hands. And Netflix has recently put out something where uh, a number of people can all watch the show at the exact same time and get into a chat room. So he and I are going to begin a rewatch of Altered Carbon, and then later we're going to do The Boys. But for Altered Carbon, we're going to basically be uh, once a day around lunchtime watching an episode and doing it in Netflix. And for anyone who's a Patreon, um, or Jess has been a guest, you'll of course also be welcome. (laughs) Um, If you want to take a lunch break or something like that and watch the episode with us and be in a chat room with us as we kind of, you know, live talk about it and then get ready to, to podcast about it. Um, all patrons are welcome to that. So it's a nice incentive to sign up for the Patreon. Um, and I also just want to kind of say about the Stranded Panda Network, there's a lot of other great uh, podcasts on there worth checking out that really approach, bring the kind of approach we bring uh, to a lot of other shows, MCU, DC, Star Trek, etc. So please check those out. Please think about joining us on Patreon or supporting the show with a five-star review on iTunes or anywhere else you do that. Uh, but most more than anything, please stay a part of these conversations. Let us know what you thought of Birds of Prey, what you thought about what we talked about. We'd love to hear from you. So uh, I have myself and everyone else. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Bye.